Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning virtual church service of the collective of uh, churches in Eastern Ottawa and the Udaway. Today we're going to be examining the idea of the table, uh, the table that we're called to as God's children, the table that God offers to us as a place to gather as um, God's children and what that all means. Whose table is it? What's it like to meet people around the table that we might be surprised are there? And what happens when we try to take ownership of that table? Some great things happen and some not so great things happen. The image I'd like to invite us to consider is as you can tell, it's been raining here this morning and the table is covered with water and uh, there's nobody in the park where normally at this time of day there would be. And so the rain has probably just kept people away. And there's a two-part image in that. Part of it is that the rain, the bad weather, has kept people away. And I think it's easy for us to see how sometimes in our relationships we can create a lot of bad weather. There's another way to look at it, and sometimes we hear the metaphor of the rain being God's way of weeping for God's creation. So put that together. The water on the table is maybe some of the bad weather that uh, is getting created in the way that we uh, take ownership of this table. And the water also is God's tears when God sees um, that the table is empty. We will find hope in today's service. I have no doubt of that. We will find God's grace in today's service. I have no doubt of that either. And so, my friends, as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, be blessed, be a blessing. Amen. I call you into worship from this place. Charlevoix Street, Mackay, uh, Beechwood Avenue going by behind me, the busyness of the world around us. From all of that busyness, we come into worship. As so we come into worship on Worldwide Communion Sunday, we imagine the crossing of boundaries between nations all around the world. And in this time, I'm imagining the crossing of boundaries that, that, that keeps me separated from a place near and dear to my heart, uh, the retirement home right across the street. Uh, New Edinburgh Square, one of the many places that we as, uh, as congregations serve, at one of the places where our, our, res our, our uh, uh, congregants live, certainly dear friends and members of Mackay living here at New Edinburgh Square, and we're not able to visit each other in this time. So on this Sunday, imagining worldwide communion, I just want to imagine a communion that breaks and connects us and breaks the barriers and acknowledges that someday we will be together. Uh, we will be together safely. In the meantime, we come to worship and we do all that uh, we're called to do on this, on this day. I, uh, I invite us as we, as we pray, I invite you to hear the words from a favorite poet of mine, Christian Wyman. Uh, Once in the West is the collection and he wrote a poem called Prayer. And uh, it, it's uh, an invitation to, uh, to enter into prayer this day. For all the pain passed down the genes or latent in the very grain of being. For the lordless mornings, the smear of spirit, words intuit and inter. For all the nightfall neverness inking into me even now. My prayer is that a mind blurred by anxiety or despair might find here a trace of peace. Amen. Good morning, friends. How are you doing today? Was it a good week for you? Have the leaves changed colors around your house? Fall is my favorite time of year. I love the temperature outside when it's chilly and I get to wear big sweaters. I love when the leaves change color 
and it's so beautiful. I love the sound of crunching leaves under my feet when they get dried out. Do you ever rake up the leaves into big piles and jump into them? That's one of my favorite things to do. Not the raking the leaves, the jumping into the piles of leaves. Friends, today is a special day. It's Worldwide Communion Sunday. Do you remember what communion is? We've talked about that before. We've had communion together by TV like this before, haven't we? Do you remember what you need to have for communion? You need to get things, don't you? You need to get something to eat and you need to get something to drink, don't you? When we're at church, what we usually have is we usually have grape juice to drink and we usually have some kind of bread to eat. But we've been having communion on TV like this. We've been having it virtually and we've been doing fun things with what we've been having for communion. So it's communion today, which means that after we're done talking, you're going to need to go and find something to eat and drink for communion for your family. Do you think you can do that? But before you do, we have a story to share. I have a story to share with you. And it's a wonderful book. It's a book called All Are Welcome, and it's by Suzanne Kaufman. And this book, All Are Welcome, it's talking mostly about a school. But when I was reading this story, I thought, it's not just talking about a school classroom. It's talking about our church, too, where all people are welcome. And I thought this would be a really good book to read today because it's Worldwide Communion Sunday. That means that our friends all over the world who love Jesus, who are Christians, who have communion together, we're all having it on the same Sunday. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine people all over the world sharing communion together? Let's think about all of our friends all over the world as we share together this story. All are welcome. And then I'll come back and we'll talk about it. So let's listen to our story. Here you go. All are welcome. Pencils sharpened in their case. Bells are ringing. Let's make haste. School's beginning. Dreams to chase. All are welcome here. No matter how you start your day, what you wear, when you play, or if you come from far away, all are welcome here. In our classroom, safe and sound, fears are lost and hope is found. Raise your hand, we'll go around. All are welcome here. Gather now, let's all take part. We'll play music, we'll make art, we'll share stories from the heart. All are welcome here. Time for lunch, what a spread. A dozen different kinds of bread. Pass it around till everyone's fed. All are welcome here. Open doors, rush outside. We will swing, we will slide. We'll have fun side by side. All are welcome here. We're part of a community. Our strength is our diversity. A shelter from adversity. All are welcome here. We'll learn from each other. Special talents we'll uncover. There's a big world to discover. All are welcome here. So much to learn, so much to do. And when the busy day is through, can't wait to come back, start anew. All are welcome here. Head for home to get some rest and greet tomorrow ready and fresh. Our time together is the best. All are welcome here. You have a place here. You have a space here. You are welcome here. What did you think of our story? Did that sound at all like your classroom? A place where you make art and music a place where you learn things and you share, a 
place where you make friends, a place where you grow. Even when you're doing school online, you do all those things, don't you? You just do it in a different way. But there was one thing that the book kept on saying over and over and over again. It was, all are welcome here. That means that everybody has something special to bring. It means that everybody has an important place where we're at. It means that everybody matters, doesn't it? And that's what matters at school. All are welcome at school. And friends, that's especially important in church, isn't it? Everybody is welcome. And that means everybody is welcome to be here with us on TV and being part of church. And that means that when we're in our buildings, everybody is welcome to be in our buildings. And that's especially important when we share communion together. When we eat and we drink and we remember about how much God loves us to send us Jesus, when we remember about Jesus' life and what he taught us, it's important when we do that to say that everybody can share in that together. And that's what we say. All are welcome at our table for communion. And so you, my friends, are welcome to share in communion with us, to share in the time where we remember Jesus and we give thanks for all that he taught us and for God's love for us. So after this time together, I'm gonna to ask you to go and find something special to eat and something special to drink, and we can share it together. We can think about people all over the world who are sharing different things to eat and drink, but are sharing communion together. Everybody is welcome. Why don't we have a prayer together to say thank you to God for the gift of communion and inviting everybody to communion to be welcome together. Let's have a prayer together, friends. Dear God, thank you for sending us Jesus. Thank you for what he taught us. We try to live our lives like Jesus did in loving, peaceful, welcoming ways. You love everybody, God. You love us and we love you. Amen. My friends, you are welcome here at church. You are welcome at the communion table to have communion with us. You are a special and important part of who we are and we are glad you are here. I can't wait to join you and to join all of our brothers and sisters, our friends all around the world to have communion together. What a special time that will be. My dear ones, I will be thinking about you as I have communion. Know that God loves you and I love you so much. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.
please join our hearts together in the spirit of prayer as we pray our prayer of confession, a lament. Gracious God, our creator and teacher, you have gifted us with this amazing vineyard and called us to be caretakers of it, acting in ways that reflect your vision of justice and truth. And yet we know how often we seem to have rejected your vision of inclusivity, where all people are to be made welcome at your table of grace and abundant life, no matter their race, social status, gender, religion, or place of origin. Each week we hear of the ravages to lands, forests, and oceans, much of which is to be laid at the feet of climate change, which we have in our power to control. If only we would listen and enact policies that reflect our responsibility. We've ignored the prophets of the past, as well as the many modern prophetic voices which speak with such passion, especially in this pandemic time. And as our societies fracture along economic and racial lines, even in our own city of Ottawa and nearby villages, we lament the harm done to children as hateful words and actions bring harm to them body and soul and to all of us. These prophetic voices, both past and present, invite us to reflect on the depths of our own hearts, where fear or unease might be leading us to suspiciousness of others, perhaps considering conspiracy theories as valid, allowing anxiety to take root in us, at a time when we need to bathe ourselves in the light of your loving presence where peace and healing abounds. You are calling us back to an authentic relationship with you, O oh God, to leave the tangled web of our fears and feelings with you, laying them gently at the foot of your cross, so that we might hear again your forgiveness of our sins through Christ Jesus our Lord. As we worship this day, hearing your words in parable, sermon, and in song, may we take up your invitation to be caretakers of your vineyard, deeply grounding our hearts and actions in your divine wisdom and truth. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher, and Redeemer. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verse 33 to 46. Another of one of uh, Jesus' very challenging parables. This is known as the parable of the wicked tenants. And although it is um, directed to the listeners at that time, who were the Jewish leaders who had the authority, it also carries a universal message that is has important meaning for all of us to wrestle with. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? 
They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce of the harvest time. Jesus said to, the, to them, <clears throat> Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing to our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized he was speaking about them, and they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Like some of you, I chose not to watch the presidential candidate debate on Tuesday night. With all that is going on in the world, I simply could not handle any more ugliness or shouting or division being thrown in my face. And really, we knew it wasn't going to end well, right? But come Wednesday morning, I couldn't help sneak a peek at snippets of the event like some kind of rubbernecking voyeur wanting to get a glimpse of just how awful it was. And it was truly awful. My heart breaks for our brothers and sisters to the south who, in a matter of weeks, are going to be faced with upheaval and unrest no matter who gets elected into the Oval Office. Now more than ever, the United States needs our prayers, as does the leadership within our own country and around the world. Being a leader is no easy task. Be it the leader of a country, or a teacher in a classroom, or a parent in a household. Holding positions of accountability and authority in our workplace, in our community, in our families, comes with great challenge. And whether it was Voltaire or Churchill or Spider-Man who reminded us that with great power comes great responsibility, in times of world crises, like the pandemic we are facing, we know the weight of leadership is amplified a hundredfold. Perhaps that's why so many of us are feeling so worn out and exhausted by our daily lives. Because every decision we make, every interaction we have, every time we choose to step foot outside our front door, we are faced with potential life and death consequences. And after a while, even figuring out what to eat for supper feels like a monumental decision. So we look to our faith, to the gospel, for words of hope and inspiration. And Matthew presents us with a story of vineyards and tenants, of treachery and betrayal, of murder and mayhem that feels like anything but good news. And yet again, we are left scratching our heads and wondering just what it is that Jesus is trying to get at. So maybe, before we can glean what the story has for us today, we need to take a look at the context in which it was originally told. This part of Jesus' ministry, and Matthew's Gospel, is full of parables. Stories about nature or human affairs that Jesus used to convey spiritual meanings. In this particular example, the story of the treacherous tenants is the second in a series of three parables Jesus told to the chief priests and elders in the temple in Jerusalem, just days before his arrest and crucifixion. The spiritual meaning he was working to convey was pretty simple. Jesus was calling the priests and elders to account for their stewardship of the vineyard God had given to them their stewardship as the leaders of the chosen people of Israel. 
Now, we may not be able to interpret Jesus' message this clearly, given the bloodshed and mayhem and all. So preacher Barbara Brown Taylor encourages us to think of this parable in our own times. Adapting her paraphrase, we might hear Jesus telling a story of a wealthy man from Montreal who bought a derelict vineyard in Niagara, seeing potential where no one else could. He pruned the vines, fertilized them, fixed up the outbuildings, added some amenities, and put the place up for lease. A local family expressed interest, and a deal was reached such that they would tend the land and give the businessman 10% of the wine they hoped they would eventually produce. With a shake of a hand and good wishes all round, the businessman went on his way, and no one heard from him again. The tenants lovingly cared for the vineyard. They strung lines and coaxed the vines to grow along them. When rain didn't fall as they had hoped, they laid miles upon miles of tubing and watered the vines with care. When the early frosts came, they covered the vines with the same tenderness. They would tuck their children into bed and kept vigil to ensure the vine's survival. And their hard work paid off. The yield was good, so good, in fact, that the tenants had to hire in extra help for the harvest. They worked in shifts, day and night, to bring in all the grapes, and the local farmers were all impressed at what these tenants had managed to accomplish. They succeeded in bottling more cases of wine than they could have ever hoped for, and they looked forward to popping the cork on this year's bottles in a few years' time. They were rubbing their sore backs, putting the last few cases into the cellar when they heard the gravel crunching under tires outside and they went out to see an 18-wheeler backing toward them. Two men with bulging biceps flung open the trailer doors and started piling cases onto dollies without so much as an introduction. When one of the tenants went up to negotiate the 10% business, one of the big guys just picked him up and set him out of the way. So the rest of the workers had a quick huddle and decided it was time to show these guys from the big city who was boss. One of them hopped into the forklift, others grabbed shovels and hammers, and before long they had convinced the landowner's men to return to Montreal empty-handed, or rather, empty-trucked. But we know the tenants were wrong, don't we? It was not their vineyard. They had made a deal, and the owner deserved his fair share of the yield. Yet something about that story doesn't sit quite right. Perhaps because it smacks of slavery and indentured servitude. Perhaps because so many of us feel like the workers in the story, tired of toiling and sweating so that large corporations and fat cat CEOs can sit back and get rich. Maybe even because we are so proud or feel so entitled to the fruits of our labor that we simply don't want to share what we have produced. And to us, Jesus replies, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. And there ends our gospel for the day. But listen to the very next verse. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus, they realized that he was speaking about them, and they wanted to arrest him. And knowing the end of the story, we know that arrest him they did. And like the son in the parable, Jesus was soon to be killed. Killed for the message he preached, the challenge Jesus issued to those in charge, that the inheritance was to be shared with all humanity, yet they wanted to keep it for themselves. That's really what we're talking about here, and if you've ever been involved in a family fight over an inheritance, you know how ugly it can be. But in this case, the fight isn't over silver or china, stocks, bonds, or real estate. It's over the legacy of God's love and the promise of abundant life that is offered to all. 
In the end, this parable, like so many other stories of Jesus, is about who's in and who's out. And more importantly, who gets to decide who's in and who's out. Jesus' message was loud and clear. It's not up to us to decide who's in or out, who are the haves and who are the have-nots, who gets to sit at the table and who waits for scraps to be thrown their way. That's God's job. A message so beautifully simple and so radically countercultural that they killed Jesus for it. Like the treacherous tenants who had taken over the vineyard and forgotten who owned it in the first place, the leaders of the religious institution of Jesus' day had taken over the covenant that God made with creation and used it for their own power and gain. It's not a pretty story, but it's a common one. The irony is that the very church founded on the teachings of the one murdered because he dared to preach the good news of God's inclusive love has sometimes fallen into the same trap, using its power and authority to protect its power and authority, forgetting that its task is to nurture the vineyard, the garden, the creation as God's stewards. Much as this is a distasteful parable for a preacher to have to preach on, it's an important one because it emphasizes that as Christians, as faith communities, and as leaders, we need to recall and recommit to the fact that our leadership has to be markedly different from that which is witnessed on a regular basis. Not just to set us apart or to set the church apart, but to show the world what true leadership looks like. To be an example to the world of leadership that seeks to care for the meek, that works for righteousness, that advocates for peace. Certainly, Jesus' words are an indictment against leaders who can't seem to care for their own, but the disciples were privy to this conversation and they also need to be reminded of what leadership looks like in the kingdom of heaven, especially now, the day after their arrival in Jerusalem. And these 2,000 years later, we also need to be reminded of what leadership looks like in the kingdom of heaven again and again, especially now when hypocrisy seems acceptable, even expectable, and justice for all really means justice for just a few. There are plenty of leaders out there, church and state, who have forgotten that central to leadership is the faithful care of those under their charge. And of course, there are some who have not simply had a temporary lapse in memory. It's inherent in their DNA not to care. It is who they are, and they never should be, never should have been granted leadership and the power that comes with it, because they only know and exercise the kind of power that takes advantage of others, uses others, and is turned in on itself. I suspect that none of us would need look very far to find leaders who, without a blink of an eye, would make a tea time instead of making sure that those for whom they are responsible have their basic needs met. But lest you think this is purely a political sermon, I think there remains truth for each one of us to hear in this parable, especially on Worldwide Communion Sunday. For it reminds us that we have been entrusted to care for God's people. We have been given this vineyard that the owner fixed up just so for us, and we have been asked to take care of it with all the love and dedication and possibility that we can muster. Not because we think it will make us rich, not because it belongs to us, but because we have the gifts and the skills to do something beautiful with it. And when we have a good harvest, everyone benefits. You see, my friends, while we work it, 
while we tend it, while we worry and labor and sweat and sacrifice for it, it never really was our vineyard. We were fortunate enough to be able to be part of the beautiful venture that yielded something amazing. We were recipients of the abundance of a land that was never ours in the first place. And if God can be that generous with us, then we can be sure that God wants us to be that generous with every single person we encounter, regardless of nationality or political affiliation or gender identity or sexual orientation or age or income level or language or beliefs. All are welcome to tend the vineyard with us and to be part of the magnificent harvest that awaits. May we be the kind of workers who exercise justice, decency, generosity, and kindness. And may God give us the strength to be good and faithful tenants. Amen. As we prepare 
to gather together virtually for communion. We gather at this table, we gather at the tables that are in our homes, we gather around coffee tables and end tables and kitchen tables, and we remember that we are all welcome. We know whose we are, we belong to God, and so with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, we gather together this morning to remember the gift that God gave us in Jesus and to celebrate his life, his death, and his resurrection as we share in this time of communion. You are welcome here. All are welcome at this table. sure who you really are When all you feel is the shape of your scars And you have more wounds than you can count Open your eyes, look all around You aren't alone, this is your Welcome to World Communion Sunday. We are stewards of Christ's radical welcome to the table. All are welcome to this table, your tables, whatever table we find ourselves on today, whether it be a couch or a chair or standing up in our kitchen over the sink, 
This is time for us to commune with God and commune with Christians all over the world. It began at the international dateline as the sun moved westward. Christians in Australia and New Zealand, in China, in Asia, in the Middle East, in Europe, in Africa, and finally here in North America celebrated World Communion Sunday. We all thanked God for creation, for Jesus, for the Word made flesh. We thank God for creating this world, for forming us, forming our church and our faith. We remembered that night that Jesus was betrayed, when he took the bread and he broke it and he thanked you as we thank you and said, this is my body broken for you. Likewise, he took the cup, thanked you as we thank you and said, this is my blood shed for you. We remember Jesus this way. We remember him as the bread of life and the cup of the new covenant. We pray that the Holy Spirit be with us in what we do today. That the Spirit finds us in whatever corner of the world we may be in or whatever nook and cranny of our home that we may be celebrating communion in. That this moment be infused with love and imagination and a deep connection with our God, with each other, with Jesus. The bread from around the world will take many forms. Some will be made with flour from wheat, some with rice, some with corn. Some folks might not have any bread at all. They may have to scrounge up something that will do, but it will do because it is a creation of God just as we are. Love knows no bounds. And so we take a few moments right now in silence, wherever we are with whatever we have, to partake in this sacrament. May the Lord make us truly grateful. May we go out from this moment enlivened. May we go out from this moment refreshed, replenished, energized, and deeply connected to one another by, with, and for our God. Amen. Destroy. 
as we join with saints and angels to repeat the sounding joy. And so that brings us to the end of our service. But it certainly doesn't bring us to the end of our journey. You remember at the beginning I said I was so sure that we would find hope during today? Well look, the table's dry. And the sun's coming out. And if you look around now, the park is starting to fill with people. And people are out walking their dogs. And they're here with their kids. And they're starting to mill about again. What a great metaphor for the cleansing and healing presence of the table where everybody is welcome. And so with that in mind, let's remember always to seek out the wisdom and the love of God, embrace the courage and the compassion of Jesus Christ, and be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Here it comes, say it with me, be blessed, be a blessing, amen. You have a great day. We'll see you next week. Bye.